heated when you're in Nordstrom Rack anyway, okay? You, you see like the last pair of eight and a half shoes mm -hmm. that you know you wanted, they're like Franco Sardo or whatever. I don't know brands, but that was like a brand that came to mind. Uh, so she's already mad, she's already privileged in white. She already is like waiting for this moment. She goes on to say that the officers uh, or that the people in Nordstrom Rack are being racist because there was another woman inside not wearing a mask who was black, but she didn't get called out. So of course, in her mind, that's racism. But she went to her school board meeting um, and began to read from the book Out of Darkness, a book by Ashley Hope Perez. Um, and that book is, uh, I just, I don't know how if I can even talk about this. It is a book about a love affair. So guys, so remember, remember how this is all about critical race theory and about books are no longer for studying, books are just there to trigger you. Um, the book chronicles a love affair between an African American boy and a Mexican American girl against the backdrop of a horrific 1937 explosion in East Texas, which killed nearly 300 school children and teachers. Which is a crazy story to begin with. So like one, amazing history and two, wow, okay, so there is a, 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 a Gay love affair between an African American boy and a Mexican. Oh no, no, we're not gay. So sorry, I don't know why I said that. Okay, okay, it's super straight. Not that that changes anything. Okay, so there's this love affair, and she goes in front of the the high school board, or and she starts reading this passage, in which a butthole is referred to as a cornhole, and she then says in very hop and on pop style. I do not want anal sex. I do not like anal sex. Do not give me anal sex. Please nobody clip out what I just said because that would be a misrepresentation. Okay. <laughs> but like, so she's going in front of the school board screaming about anal sex. This, this is her, this is who she thinks she is. This is her, this is the hill she will die on, Nalini. Imagine going out like that. What are your thoughts on, on this Karen? Oh, wow. Well, she has the finger pointing very um, that my family taught me about very young. Um, but I mean, this is, I mean, this is when folks feel like their entire race is going to be extinct, as they say, right? That they are oppressed and have had nothing on their side for years and years and years. And I just don't understand how apparently good, Christian, um, uh, you know, God-fearing uh, people can just go on a rant about anal sex um, in front of a school board for minutes. Um, <laughs> so, you know, if she's trying to keep the kids away from it, maybe not talk about it at all. <laughs> like, I think she's doing actually like a little bit of a like, maybe she's maybe, you know what, maybe she's actually like, you know what, I got to give a little bit of sex education lesson. Maybe it's, it's this, um, you know, it's a subversive thing, but I I just have to laugh over and over again, and I I, I want to edit that in. Uh, so hopefully everyone can go take a look at it. Maybe we'll put it in the description. Yes, if you want people to not do anal, don't keep saying it over and over again. Uh, and I'm glad we uh, squeezed the story in there. No pun intended. Oh my God, Nalini Stamp, thank you so much for being on. Everybody follow thank Nalini on the socials. Uh, stay tuned for all the work that Working Families Party does um, really across the country. And, and thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and thanks everyone for being here in the chat. Thank you for supporting me uh, through this like ridiculous Monday. It's been nothing but fantastic, guys. And remember, stay safe out there, stay sane out there. John will be back tomorrow and slay out there. Bye bye.
welcome. It is indisputable. I'm your host, Rashad Ritchie. Ladies and gentlemen, we now have the I wish a Karen Wood t shirts. I am flexing mine right now. You see how beautiful that is. Make sure you go to shoptyt.com. Shoptyt.com. You can get a shirt there. Um, those shirts are doing very well. Remember the goal, the goal, ladies and gentlemen, is to have on your I wish a Karen Wood t shirt while confronting a Karen, recording that Karen, and then showing your I wish a Karen Wood t shirt and sending it directly here. All will be right with the universe. If you do that, everything will be restored as it relates to the space time continuum. All right, we got a lot of show today, a whole lot of show. My big homie Wozni Lombre will break down news of the day. Uh, don't forget to watch Wozni at 10 p.m. Eastern Time Tuesdays. That's a Twitch exclusive. Also, he's host of the Woke Bros and writer at The Ringer will be joining me, breaking down all news of the day. And also during the bullpen, we have Jacob Rich, Reason Foundation senior contributor to Young Voices. We'll talk about his issues with vaccines and masks and you know things that make common sense to everybody else, all right? Top news story of the day. There's a school system, ladies and gentlemen, yes, a school system that has decided to ban a Rosa Parks children's book. A book that has been widely accepted as a routine book for young learners in the United States of America. They have now banned this book, this is in York, Pennsylvania. But the students, they're fighting back. Let me show a picture of the book <laughs> cover, here it is. That's dangerous, <laughs> according to School officials, that book teaches critical race theory, that book. So let me get this right, that's dangerous. Let's put it up again, dangerous, and then this, not dangerous. Dangerous, not so much. These are the kind of people you're dealing with, number one, all right? So they've decided to ban this book. Let me give you some background to this. Um, children's book author Brad Meltzer spoke to CNN about his book, I Am Rosa Parks, ending up on the ban list. He has penned a series of children friendly biographical books that describe historic figures and American presidents. Uh, Neil Armstrong is there and Frank is there. Albert Einstein is there, Jim Henson, Walt Disney, Abraham Lincoln, George Washington. And listen, I can think of a few things, a few reasons why some of these folks should not be in the lineup. But Rosa freaking Parks, I told you all from day one, if you've been following Indisputable, I told you from day one that this whole debate about critical race theory was never about critical race theory. The phraseology CRT is not even in the context of these laws that are being passed around the United States of America. The issue was to create a pretext to have a context to eliminate books and curriculum study like what you're seeing today. They want to ban a book, children's book about Rosa Parks, okay? That is the idea. The ban initially occurred last October. When the all white school board banned books that surround race, social justice, and history. There's a school teacher, I have great heart for school teachers. I was adopted by a school teacher. I went into education, I'm a professor today because of the impact of that school teacher. There's a school teacher who works in the district. She's been there for more than 20 years. She said, and I quote, there are teachers looking over their shoulders. Wondering if someone's going to be at their door, darkening their door, saying you said something or you mentioned something or used or used something that you were not supposed to use. Curriculum police is real. During the virtual meeting, school officials stated it has frozen. Now watch the trick here, frozen the use of the materials so it could vet them. 
Uh, this is a damn children's book. It takes about <laughs> maybe a few minutes to read. <laughs> it has taken these people over a year to get to this. Remember, this is the book. No one has read that in over a year. They're still vetting that book, okay? Uh, so they're saying it hasn't banned them. However, the vetting process began close to a year ago and the school board upheld prohibiting the materials, which means it will last beyond a year. Um, when the author spoke about this on CNN, he said, and I quote, they can learn empathy and compassionate kindness. That's what the book portrays, that's what the book says. They can call it a freeze, but when kids can't get these books, it's a ban. And these kids can't get the story of Rosa Parks. Once again, I told you so, CRT pretext to create the context to eliminate books that deal with social and racial diversity in America. And now you see it, they didn't take a lot of time to do it. Big Waz, what are your thoughts? You know, I always hesitate anytime we're dealing with some of this stuff to invoke Nazism or the Nazis, but book burning, book banning is <clears throat> is straight out of the Nazi playbook. Mm-hmm. I'm like, there's no other way to say it. That's one of the first things they did was round up the intellectuals, uh, like literally collect books and burn them in the town square. That's literally one of the first orders of operation that they did when they took power. So yeah, this does evoke images of you know one of the greatest atrocities in, in world history. Not to say that they are about to start rounding people up and killing them, but who's to say, Dr. Rashad, who's to say? And another thing that I think is you know <laughs> wrong headed in, in all of this, uh, the first, the first rule of making something appealing to teenagers is to ban it. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> okay, like this is going to have the reverse and opposite effect. It's gonna make these kids gonna gonna go want to go out and seek these books out, seek these teachings out because you guys have made them these mundane things like Rosa Parks into a taboo because of just stupid fear and ignorance. It's yeah. It's amazing, honestly. And the students young and those not so young, some of the high school seniors, students all across the spectrum are now fighting back. So you're correct on that for sure. We always talk about police reform, I'm gonna shift gears. And we talk about the necessity of having good police officers, right? Well, you gotta have good leadership. There's a black police chief trying to implement common sense reform, trying to get rid of symbols that remind the community of the KKK. And yes, there's pushback. Let's go to this guy named Joel Fitzgerald. Put up a picture of Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Fitzgerald was slammed because he wanted to get rid of a symbol. I'm gonna give you some background to this story. Fitzgerald was slammed with criticism last fall after he and a few other city council members began pushing for the department's emblem to be removed. All right, sounds like something just and worthy. Um, This doesn't sound controversial, at least not yet. And I wanna remind everyone that this issue was still ongoing, okay? So the city council members are with the chief here, uh, began pushing for the department's emblem to be removed. The report notes that the green eyed red bodied uh, Griffin, uh, which is ancient mythic creature uh, that was uh, that has been emblazoned on the officers patches since the 1960s, bears striking resemblance to what? The Ku Klux Clowns, okay? The council voted in favor of removing the symbol in a five to two vote. Fitzgerald historic feat did not go over well with his coworkers and some of the city residents. Can we put up a picture of what's in question here? Okay, okay. Now, I wanna remind you that this is the first black police chief of this district. Um, Let's put the symbols up again. On the left is the police emblem. On the right are the KKK 
grand dragon symbols. Fitzgerald said, and I quote, I don't think there's any police chief in America in a small or medium sized department that has endured this for the reason I have endured it. And I think the reasons I have to do with race, <laughs> you don't say, said Fitzgerald, who previously served as the chief of larger departments in Fort Worth, Texas and Allentown, Pennsylvania. This is my fourth job being the first black police chief. I've dealt with pushback at other places, but never so overt, never so non factual. Fitzgerald <coughs> noted that he and his boss, who's the mayor, Quentin Hart, the city's first black mayor, they have now received several threats and racist backlash following the controversial move. Some of the negative comments have come from a few of his predecessors, including city council member Margaret Klein, who wrote on her Facebook page that the, and I quote, beat down of our police officers continues. <laughs> Adding that she was devastated by the removal of the beloved 50 year patch design. She has now called for Chief Fitzgerald's resignation. Now get this, this is the same council member who would have given someone a promotion for beating up an unarmed person, especially if they were black. But don't you dare touch that KKK symbol. Oh No, you need to resign from your post. Um, <laughs> this is still ongoing. Uh, Wise, I'm gonna go to you about this, man. What are your thoughts? The melodrama from police types just always, it never ceases to amaze. Uh, we're being beat down cuz we might switch out the dragon, which is so clearly KKK uh, iconography with something like, I don't know, a terrier, uh, you know, I don't like a lion, something just less offensive. Like, you know, the idea, of like, oh, it means vigilance. Like, all right, cool. Are you guys so uncreative that you can't come up with another way to another emblem, another symbol that would demonstrate vigilance and courage and all of this other? Crap that these guys claim this dragon, this dragon espouses. Uh, it's it's just amazing, and it's hard, you know, it's hard to take anything that comes out of police uh, sort of rhetoric at it on its face at their word because they're so ridiculous at times. Something as simple as just switching out um, the iconography turns into, you know. All of this hand wringing, and it's hard to take these guys serious when it comes to getting stuff right in the communities that that need it the most. When they give this level of pushback for something this innocuous, innocuous and unimportant. Yeah, and let me tell you how deep this runs. Now, this is in Waterloo, okay? And this guy has a history of successfully integrating police departments and implementing diverse policies, right? So he he's the guy. If you want to do this with your police department, this is the guy you hire. He's has he has a successful track record. According to Black and Blue Police Advocacy, they released a statement calling the mayor a radical mayor. Now this is about an emblem. Calling the mayor a radical mayor for supporting the emblem's removal. The group also released an anonymous survey taken by a dozen retirees and current staff members of the department that showed 98 members, all 98 members of the police department believed now that the chief was not fit for his current position. Damn near 100% of his staff have turned against him because of an emblem. Now, let me ask you this question. What emblem, if not connected to racial sentiment, would do that to almost 100% of your staff? None. It's connected to the racial core of who they believe they are. All right. Let me move on to this next story. Um, Congressman Madison Cawthorn says he carries a knife everywhere and also, obviously, illegally carried one on school property. He attended a school board meeting in Henderson County where he spoke against, um, he spoke against mask mandates. Uh, he was there, uh, an attendee snapped a photo of what appeared to be a knife stored underneath, underneath his wheelchair. Uh, here it is, let's get the picture. Yeah, bringing a knife onto public school grounds is in fact a class one misdemeanor in North Carolina. But the Henderson County Sheriff's Office announced that the congressman would not be charged. In a statement, the sheriff's office said that the decision took into account the 
full circumstances of the incident. And then said, although unacceptable, occasionally a person inadvertently possesses a knife. <laughs> now remember, the congressman did not admit to guilt, the sheriff did it for him, okay? Um, in another weapons incident earlier this year, that same congressman attempted to board a plane uh, in uh, Asheville at the regional airport when the TSA workers found an unloaded gun on his carry on bag along with a loaded magazine. I mean, he's violating the laws all over the place. That's <laughs> according to, to the airport officials. Additionally, the same Congressman Cawthorn um, said he was armed inside of the US Capitol during the building's January 6th storming. Um, the supporters of Donald Trump committing the act of terrorism. He said he was armed then, re ready. He's trying to get armed on an airplane. Why is he not on the do not fly list? Because hmm? I guarantee you, if Rashad Ritchie would have come to an airplane with a gun and a magazine, uh, I would absolutely not be able to fly the friendly air, airways or the friendly skies anytime soon. All right, Big Waz, what are your thoughts about the congressman here? You know, I, I, I just harken back to a time, Dr. Ritchie, and I know you're familiar. Back when you had to be nice with your hands, you know what I mean? It wasn't about. <laughs> A gun, it wasn't about a knife. You had to square up and be nice with your hands and get busy. So it's hard for me to respect this dude running around scared all of these weapons because he can't handle himself. You feel me? So that's that's my feeling on it, Dr. Richie. Bring back hands. Brother, <laughs> brother, truer words have not been spoken. All right, we got more on the other side. It's indisputable stick and stay. I'm old enough that I remember when Captain Crunch put the berries in there. Yay, Crunch Berries! And I was like, ooh, the fake berries. Remember? We're gonna try that. We did a story <laughs> back in the day about how a woman sued, uh, I don't know, General Mills. <laughs> She'd been eating it for four years right. believing that it was actual berries. Yeah, yeah, she's like, these aren't real berries at all. Yeah. I'm like, I got news for you, Captain Crunch isn't really a captain or a person. <laughs> <laughs> Joining me now, legendary whistleblower and American hero, Edward Snowden. First question is, hey, where are you? <laughs> I'm in my apartment in <laughs> Moscow. All of a sudden, in the studio, Jim Gaffigan, everybody. Mental illness is you know, completely undiagnosed in our society. It's not about a particular administration. It's about a broken system of power. And through that, really, the instrumentalization of a system of not justice, but injustice. People understand whether they claim to deny climate change or not. Our collective house is in crisis. We're also dealing with the legacy of 40 years of economic policies that have made people's lives more precarious. Sometimes you gotta force people into their humanity. Sometimes you have to shake people into empathy. Senator Elizabeth Warren joins us in the studio. Healthcare is a basic human right, and we are fighting for basic human rights. In order to actually achieve that vision of everyone having access to the same resources and getting to determine the outcome of their life, we have a lot of work to do, and it needs to start right now. Here's something you may not know. When you deposit your money in a big bank, it doesn't just sit safe and secure in a vault. Instead, your money could end up building oil pipelines, mining for coal, or drilling in the Arctic. So if you're concerned about the planet, give your money something good to do. Make the move to green with Aspiration's fossil fuel free account and join the thousands each week who are switching to save their dollars and save the planet at the same time. Welcome to the Damage Report, I'm John Iderola. This is gonna be a big one. What Donald Trump has done as president has cut taxes for the wealthy and made life better for rich people. But he's made life worse for poor people. We're making America great again by throwing more money at the military to destroy other countries because that makes us great instead of investing it in ourselves. That it's Donald Trump and it's Stephen Miller. The choosing is based on wanting to create cruel and inhumane conditions to scare other people away from ever coming to the United States. The opportunity to make money off of tragedy is the American way. There is only one place to put garbage people in the trash. We've never had so much access to so much information with so little idea of what the hell is going on. What does enforcing our borders have to do with traumatizing children? Absolutely nothing. I think a sane person could say the current situation we have right now is radical. But what we're doing is literally making the world more like hell. That's a warning sign.
JobTYT.com now has books. One of them is Ryan Grimm's book, We've Got People. That's a saying that AOC said, they've got money, we've got people. It's the best tracing of the AOC victory I've seen anywhere. It's the most accurate and it's got great details. The book actually goes all the way back to Jesse Jackson and how he's the original Bernie Sanders. If you want to know how we're going to win going forward, those lessons are super important and they're in Ryan's book. So check it out right now at shoptyt.com. We found the perfect person to lead the army, Allison Hartson. The establishment media works hand in glove with our corporate legislators, and our corporate legislators look work hand in glove with the corporation. And we're going to make it so that it's a decentralized force throughout the country, so that we can quickly identify stories, quickly identify troll farms, and go in and neutralize the enemy, and then start building responsible media throughout the country and on every platform available. All right, welcome back. We got a lot more of show left. Let me go to these amazing comments. Thank you for always engaging with the program. Um, I have a big announcement to make, okay? I was out of the state last week debating Charlie Kirk. So here's what we're going to do. And we debated for an hour and a half. Here's what we're going to do. This week, we're going to play that full debate with Charlie Kirk. And this is called Charlie Kirk um, Debate Night. But we're gonna play that full debate on Friday of this week. This is called an Excel bullpen, okay? So it will not be just you know, 20 or 30 minutes of the bullpen. We will have an hour and a half, maybe a little less when we calculate all of the uh, pauses. We did have a few pauses to drink a little water. Um, so I wanna make sure you are here. Uh, this was, <laughs> I was in enemy territory. I went to Turning Point to USA, all right? And listen, I, I didn't even bring a gun with me, all right? <laughs> but I was there at Turning Point to USA. Uh, Turning Point to USA was really interesting. And uh, we will play that debate uh, for the first time on air here uh, this Friday, okay? So make sure you tune in for that show, should be uh, quite, quite exhilarating. Um, also, don't forget the conversation. Live today, 5.30 p.m. to Eastern Time, 2.30 p.m. Pacific Time, tyt.com slash live. That's before the Young Turks. Make sure you subscribe, watch all of the amazing interviews there at youtube.com forward slash tyt conversation. Let me get to these comments. Kelly O'Hara, this is my poet. She says, we don't ban books here, it's America, we have free speech. Oh, they make us feel bad, disappear them, we beseech. Rosa Parks, nope, too radical, that commie was a farce. Strong women are too scary. And their lessons too hard to parse. And don't get me started on Sesame Street and my la la. Hear no evil, see no evil. La la la. Bars. <laughs> um, Tredora, oh my God, I need those shirts, stat. Let's let's put up that graphic. Y'all got that graphic? Okay. We're gonna do at least a thousand shirts today. All going to worthy causes. There you go. Boom. Real simple, real easy to get. Um, text text stand says making the sh- t-shirt and blazer combo look good. Doc, well, thank you. That was the intent. I appreciate that. Make it see the silver hair dragon. Oh my God, no tie, a t-shirt. Dr. Rich has turned into a tyt or eek. <laughs> well, for today, uh, Jambo Gino, Gino, uh, the Rosa Parks uh, book is banned because CRT is an existential threat to white supremacy. Teach the children, fight the power. That's right, that, that, that's what it is for sure. All right, super chat. Uh, Peter S says, banning a book on Rosa Parks is straight up evil. Uh, yes, uh, Luann, Luann says, love the shirt and the Tyler's Dr. Richard. Love you back and thank you for that. Uh, Leslie K, I noticed you were Tyler's, looking good doc, thank you. 
uh, Courtney, the SMP. Is this the first time we've seen him without a tie? Probably so. All right, and why are USA says conservatives are such whiny little cowards when it comes to facing reality and facts? Um, I concur, I do. Ladies and gentlemen, next story, nine cops out of Oakland. They have now been suspended and it is such a light ass suspension. They have been suspended because these bozos decided to engage in racist, sexist language on a what they thought to be just among themselves posting these ridiculous things, right? Let me give you some background. Uh, this is according to an anonymous source close with the department. Last year, someone started an Instagram account um, and it was called Crime Reduction Team. That was their Instagram account. It started mundane, uh, humorous memes about cop life became a post of racist and sexist commentary. This is what they did. Now remember, these individuals are serving the public. They have a badge, they have a gun. Um, some posts even expressing contempt for OPD preventative policies such as police brutality and corruption. All right, at this time, the identities of the officers have not been made known to the public. So here's what I do, since they play that game with us, I have a game I play back with them. Let's put up a picture of the person in charge. Okay, that's the city of Oakland, that's the guy in charge. I will give you some information about that fella in a moment. His name is Leron Armstrong. Uh, but since they refuse to provide us with the picture of the cops involved in this ridiculous activity, I will always put up their boss, okay? That's the game we'll play back with them until they release the photos of individuals who betray the public trust in this manner. Uh, let's go to some of these graphics. Here are some of the posts from the court documents, all right? This says new female recruit gets hired, mine. Cops with wives, cops with girlfriends, single cops, okay? Sexist, yes. Uh, this reaction meme features the mind, mind, mind seagulls from Pixar's film Nemo. Um, obviously meant to express how command staff declare the female recruit is mine to approach with unwanted sexual advances. That's sexist, correct? Yeah, okay, here's another one. These are cops now. This is what they're posting. So internal affairs, black guy, police commission, black guy, command staff, black guy, spineless cops, black guy. Criminals taking advantage of the situation, black guy. Cops that just want to fight crime, little white girl. That's how they view their policing. Yeah, here's another one. There's no greater form of virtue signaling than posing in the position that killed George Floyd. Them sick SOBs mocking the murder of George Floyd. I thought they were out here to arrest murderers, to protect the public. So these nine officers have been suspended according uh, to the report, an independent third party investigation began in January after Oakland Police Department <laughs> officials learned of an Instagram account with deeply offensive, offensive content. That's according to a statement Friday by Oakland Mayor, okay? Investigators seized more than 140 work phones. Now, these guys are committing crimes and committing these ridiculous, um, Ridiculous threats and sexual harassment dynamics on the company phone. The investigation revealed that a former police officer created the Instagram account shortly after he was fired for violating department policy. And so what did he do? He got nine others to join him as well. <laughs> that's what he did. I mean, that's not your friend, that's not your buddy. He gets fired and then he says, hey guys, Join me and let's all violate policy together. And 
nine of them at least did. Um, the OPD apparently has several policies to place a limit on officer speech and conduct, conduct on and off duty. Oakland City Council passed a resolution in June that directs the police chief and city administrator to fire any officers who exhibit racist practices, behaviors, or actions. Remember, it's a resolution already passed, it's currently the law, right? Um, once put up the, the police chief. Why don't you take a good look at this guy, okay? Because he's not enforcing the policies here, at least not to the degree that the resolution says he should. The discipline officers allegedly access inappropriate material on department issued equipment and engaged in conduct that, and I quote, brings disrep disrepute to the OPD, among other things, according to the mayor's office. Let me show you the discipline, and you tell me is this right? You tell me is this enough? Those receiving discipline range in rank from officer to lieutenant, receiving from three to 25 days of unpaid suspension. Two of the nine who received discipline have since taken jobs in other law enforcement agencies. And those two agencies have been notified of the results of the investigation according to the mayor's office. So you mean to tell me all nine kept their jobs, none of them received a pink slip, none of them were fired. And you just passed the city law, a resolution that says if our cops engage in racist activity on or off duty, they have to go. It's a new statute, we got the resolution, signed the bill, the mayor's on board, the chief is on board, but not. This is why people don't like the police, because it's unfair. If you did this at your job, and you got caught using a company phone saying sexist and racist and inappropriate things. You would be fired. I don't care how great you have been at your workplace, you would be fired. You are a liability. And let me tell you why this should concern us even more than somebody working in the private sector. Because we give cops true authority in our society. We give them this position of public trust. They have a gun and a badge and a license to use it. And this is how they violate that public trust. They're so emboldened, they're putting this on social media platforms. They're discussing these things on company devices. They're not just talking around a water cooler, they feel protected because of the culture. And if they think like this about black folk, if they think like this about women, if they think like this about command staff and the council and others who govern or try to limit some of their authority, for the sake of the public, what do you think they think about everyone else? What are your thoughts? Yeah, what it boils down to is a question of accountability. Uh, I don't think anybody is naive or stupid enough to think that we're gonna change the hearts and minds of millions of cops around the country. I think what right. we're asking for is for rules to be in place and those rules to be enforced when these guys step out of line because that's all people respond to is accountability is you know the fact that if you make a terrible mistake or you do something horrible while wearing the badge you will be reprimanded for it whether via suspension or via termination depending on the gravity of the crime that you have committed and so to watch cops over and over, all we're taught about is, well, it needs to be accountability. Well, you know, they gotta act this way when they go to certain neighborhoods because look at the crime statistics. Well, blah, 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 blah. All right, cool. When do the cops get accountability? When do yeah. they have to pay? When do they suffer the repercussions of their actions? That's all we wanna see as a community and as a people. Yeah, all they gotta do is comply. <laughs> that's it, just comply. Just like you tell someone you pull over, hey, hey, buddy, just comply. That, that's exactly. all you had to do here. There's a statute, comply. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you Karen would. You want to call the police on them for having a barbecue on a and Sunday? You feel right. Back off! I'm going to tell them there's an African American man threatening my life. Take my order. You go to the
Yeah. So she says she's going to call the police. She needs a gun at the situation. Remember, when you call 911, you're calling a gun. That's what you're calling. You need a gun to enforce a law. There's no law violation here. This privileged Karen believes that in order for somebody to take her order, that she needs to call the police to enforce this non violation. There's no violation of law here. And I just want to say this. For everyone who's watching this, she's lucky nobody served her. I know some folks would have happily <laughs> served her and put all kind of extra ingredients in whatever they handed her. Okay, so she's dealing with some decent people here because there are some folks would have been like, "Ma'am, you're absolutely correct. We are so wrong. Let's make sure we get you your service ASAP." All right. Uh, once again, nine one one. Let's enforce it. Let's bring a cop here. You got to take my order. Serve me is what she said. Was. The level of entitlement at McDonald's is just crazy. Uh, I'm sorry if you if you think you deserve like personal servants, you better take that to Tao or Philippe or something. <laughs> uh, you and I like it's McDonald's, lady. Like relax, uh, fall back. And I think you're right in the sense that uh, some knuckle sandwiches would have been served up in a couple of other neighborhoods, man. God bless the nice people of Canada. They let this lady get out of pocket. But man, I don't know, on Flat Bashad, this wouldn't have flown very long, man, I (laughs) tell you that. All right, we got more on the other side is indisputable, stick and stay. Every day, the Young Turks delivers two hours of solid, fact-based, timely news and progressive commentary on all the day's most important stories. We keep our viewers informed while also providing perspective and insight on the news we cover so you understand not only what's happening, but also what's happening behind the scenes, the stories behind the stories. Gee, I wonder why we didn't get $15 minimum wage. Because they're all raising money from the guys who don't want to increase the minimum wage. And we play musical chairs and put these children in one awful detention facility to the next. That's what's happening at the border. The things that got him banned, he's still spreading. So presumably, I think it's reasonable to say that if you allow him back on the website, he's going to do it again. Any legal voter that we deem not willing to vote for my side shouldn't vote because it'll replace me that's supposed to vote for my side. That's not how voting works. That's not how democracy works. And while many people following today's political news can get discouraged about the direction of the nation and the world, that's not us. At TYT, we're genuinely optimistic about the future and with good reason. Today, wide majorities of Americans agree with our progressive stances on issues ranging from health care and education to climate, immigration, and wages. The rising generation of young people are also overwhelmingly progressive in their political beliefs and policy objectives. And they're increasingly flexing their muscle as voters and activists to demand change from our elected officials. The traditional mainstream media is mostly AWOL. They, along with the government and many other cherished institutions, have been captured by corporate interests. Audiences sense that they're not getting the whole story or even the truth from once trusted outlets, whether broadcasting cable TV news networks or national newspapers and magazines. The Republicans say we will serve our corporate masters at all costs, including killing democracy, yet 
Here we are. Where else do you hear that? You hear that on NBC, on ABC, on CBS? You hear it nowhere. They don't want to talk about money in politics because it's really hard to pass judgment when your media organization is funded by fossil fuel companies. The antidote is the Young Turks. Unlike mainstream corporate outlets, we're not beholden to corporate advertisers, the defense contractors, the Wall Street, or the big pharma. And we don't carry water for the Republican or Democratic parties. So watch us Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific, and join the thousands of progressives around the globe who tune in every day for TYT's unmatched, award-winning content and see what it's like to experience a news organization that only answers to you. I'll continue to sit. I'm gonna continue to stand with the people that are being oppressed. The president labeled him a son of a I don't think it's good uh, to be a distraction to your team. To stand proudly for the national anthem. You know, some of these people need to move to another country. Well, you shouldn't be playing, you shouldn't be there. Maybe you shouldn't be in the country. The president is put in place to amplify the racists in this country. Black men and boys are killed at an exponentially higher rate than white men and boys, as outlined by PBS. Black people are most likely to be killed by police found mappingpoliceviolence.org. Personally, my biggest gripe is not saying how sports and politics have been attached at the hip. From the jockey syndrome, to the Negro Leagues, to Tommy Smith and John Carlos, Muhammad Ali, to modern day and everything in between. This is not an escape. It is a reflection of reality and a reflection of the times. Everything that we've accomplished over the years is because of our members who've allowed us to remain independent of corporate interests and reach 20 million followers. Now is the time to bring as many people into the progressive movement as possible. We're inviting you to be the change and help bring a community powered progressive change machine to life. Details are at tyt.com slash change. If you're a member, thank you, we need you to remain so. If you're one of the thousands of viewers out there who's not a member yet, the time has come for you to join now. We need you more than ever, tyt.com slash change. All right, welcome back. It's indisputable. Uh, make sure you get your I wish you Cameron Wood t-shirts. Uh, we got it now, shoptyt.com, shoptyt.com. I got on mine now, I wish a Cameron Wood. It's nice, it's awesome, it's beautiful. And listen, when you walk around with an I wish a Cameron Wood t-shirt, it has been known to stop Karenicity in its tracks. The shirt basically has superpowers. Okay, make sure you get one. All right, uh, let's get to some of these amazing comments. Um, I appreciate everyone who continues to engage. Um, TYT member Mickey C, the silver hair dragon says, those racist, sexist, abusive media posts by police um, are being discovered all over the US. Thousands of cops are engaging in these posts. Uh, the nine in Oakland just happened to be caught. You're absolutely correct, they just happened to be caught. And they were caught, why? Well, somebody blew the whistle. Um, and then when the department investigated, they tried to keep that secret. Somebody else blew the whistle inside of the department about the whistle that was initially blown that nobody talked about. Look at that. Okay, HR, Cat, Two, and is it Danion? My apologies if I said it wrong. Um, how is there a sex offender registry, but not an evil cop registry? Both <laughs> disgusting, both pretty sure, uh, but pretty sure a bad cop does more societal harm. Um, sad but true. Uh, and let me say this, um, obviously those um, who are sex offenders are horrible individuals. The issue with the cop registry is that in the George Floyd Policing and Accountability Act, it actually provided a remedy for that where there would be a national database of these types of incidents, okay? Um, so hopefully that gets passed at some point in the future. Um, Tradora says, okay, seriously, over McDonald's, lady, go order from the self ordering screen thing. <laughs> right, that's true. Just go to the, the screen that's self ordered, no argument whatsoever. All right. Bruno Blanco says, and here I thought that Canadians were supposed to be nice people. But everybody has a camera. Remember, Karenicity is a pandemic also. Okay, it's global. Uh, YouTube, super chat. Thomas Clifton, y'all still wondering why we don't trust the system of policing? I'm not, I know the history. Mm -hmm. By the way, 
Where were the good cops speaking up? I'll wait though. Every time, every time, where are the good cops? It's a bunch of people that are doing bad things. Then it's like, wait a minute, wait, you keep telling me it's way more good cops? Well, that means the culture would be reversed. That the good cop culture would overtake the bad cop culture. That, that's what that means, if that were true, all right? And silence does not mean you're good. Um, Twitch about Charlie Kirk. Uh, did he did he live like a capitalist that day? <laughs> I guess I did. Um, oh hell, Charlie got crushed, no doubt. It's going to be interesting. Uh, he definitely made some silly ass points that I pointed out to him clearly. On, on a couple of them, he even agreed. Um, Jacks Drax. It's almost as if they specifically hire bad apples to become cops. Wow. Sue Susie. They would just put another locker room, put this, put it in the locker room category. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Mike Boy Rap says, I used to think that Karen's had no self awareness, but now I think they try to out Karen each other for the pride and style points. There must be like some secret Karen game that we don't know about, and where points are accrued over time. I don't know. Ladies and gentlemen, my next story. Okay. Let me explain this to you. There's a white female Karen at a restaurant. She calls the manager the N word. She is committing criminal trespass. She refuses to leave and the cops take her side. The cops end up basically going after the black manager who is being lawful. Let me take you to Karen Burton. That is the Karen's name in this situation. Yes, literally her name is Karen, okay? Here's the first video. She's rude, she's confrontational, adversarial with management, refusing to leave after management repeatedly told her to leave, which is a crime of trespass. She then calls a patron the N word. Here's what happened after the cops escort or start escorting her out. Here it is. Miss, please, we really need you fall up behind me. Everything else is safety. I don't want you in my face. I'm not in your face. We're not dangerous. Okay. Your word is, it doesn't mean anything to me, okay? Could you please just back My word doesn't mean anything? No, you will not. I can you, touch you. You cannot. This is my safety, okay? This is your safety? Word, what do you, you mean? You asked us to tell the weapons on, dude. I don't care. <laughs> we don't I don't know, any, I don't know you from Adam. You might we're, have we're weapons on you. Okay, then let us not stay ahead. away. Thank you. It gets even deeper than that. So now the cops are starting to turn on the management the black management who called them, who is in no commission. They are in no commission of crime whatsoever. The only person aggressive here was Miss Karen Burton that they were escorting out. The restaurant manager has a right to record. They have a right to do this, okay? This cop wanted to create smoke between him and black management, but did not have the same energy for Karen Burton who was in fact in violation of a trespass law. Now, they get outside, they're not arresting her. They didn't tell her to move on. They're not telling her you have to leave now. They're negotiating with her, they're talking to her. And then these cops end up turning on that black manager. Here it is. I don't know what, manager, what transpired there, but the manager they asked wanted you to leave. leave. Then, I'm actually oh, one of the managers as well. Okay. Jamala, okay. Jamala, why do you call the owner? Bring I did. Here. He told me to tell you to leave and call Bring the cops. Him here. He doesn't need to come here. He told he me to tell to you, you to leave. Bring him here. He doesn't need to be here. He doesn't need to be here. <laughs> only white people can get away with. Dumb man. The only white people can get away with what? No. Yeah. Exactly. I love how 
it's it's always a white person problem. No, we're not like, doing right? that right now. Right? No, yeah, we are. Because you <laughs> right? just went there. You did. You went there. Stop. I'm sorry. Let's go. Let's go. Zip up your bag. I'll get go. Don't talk to me like that. I can talk to you any way I feel yeah. like it. Really? Yeah, really. You want to go ahead and challenge that? Zip up your and let's go. Now. You want to act like a child? You're going to get treated like a I'm child. A child. Okay. So much. You have no idea. You okay, well, we can talk about that away from here. You're not going to continue okay. to egg this situation on. Let's go. And I will press charges. <laughs> press charges on your damn self. What are you talking about, press charges? And then he's like, hey, you got to go. I can talk to you any way I want to. Listen, we could talk about this down the street, actually. I mean, we could talk about these things away from here. What? What kind of police officer are you? You come in, you don't tell her, listen, either leave or be arrested. You don't ever say that. You escort her out, you turn on the management of the company who has a right to record. You turn on her, you get outside, you're still talking like you're trying to get the digits or something. And then you defend the activity of this Karen, who's literally a Karen, by the way. And then you tell her, we gotta go, this, that, and the other, and we could just talk about that away from here. Talk about what? You gotta move on to your next beat, right? You got crime to fight. Right? Or you just want to keep talking to this Karen? Um, Burton was directing a hate field outburst toward uh, Jamila Anderson, a popular local community organizer who just days before was named philanthropist of the year by the United Way of the Greater Capital Region and had been featured on the cover of Time Magazine for her work for fighting food insecurity in Albany. That's who she called the N word. Let's put up a picture of this remarkable young woman. Mm hmm. Yeah. That's what happened here. Hundreds of comments were almost immediately pointed towards Burton's employer, calling on them to take action. Within a day, that Karen that you saw was fired from her Albany based marketing firm. Burton? Already found herself banned from at least two Lark Street establishments as a result of the video. That, that's what happens. You go around, you call people the N word, you continue to violate their rules and their policies of their private businesses, and you do so in a way where you don't care that anybody's recording, things like this may happen. Waz, what are your thoughts about it? It's, it's just amazing, honestly, that even in the era of smartphones and everybody has a phone on them, that people think they can continue to act this way. Um, and that these things won't get out to their employer, to their neighbors, to their family. Um, this stuff is shameful, man. Like, you know how many people like around her got phone calls? Like, man, did you see what Karen did in that store? Like, she behaved apparently. Like, that. Like the the idea that these people think that there won't be any accountability for this is kind of crazy to me. Uh, it's wild. It is wild. All right, here's another one. Now, I want to bring your attention to this matter. Um, this is at a Dollar General store. Uh, there's a white woman who attempted to shoplift according to the allegation. Um, she fought the employees, she fought the police. But I want you to see that she was never tackled. She was never taken down. There was no weapon used against her. She was never threatened with bodily injury, no, no gunshot, nothing. Here it is. Okay, all right. That happened, right? She's violent, she's aggressive, she's trying to shoplift. And then the police were called. Well, the police show up, she's violent with them as well. You'll see, she kicks them. Here it is.
This happened in Splendor, Texas. So you mean to tell me it can be done? You mean to tell me that a person can be physically violent against police officers and they not be tackled while being handcuffed? They were not tased, they did not have any bodily injury. There was no weapon used against them. They still put her in the police car. Wow, Was they told us it couldn't happen like this. You know, <laughs> it's wild whenever you see the police actually behave like civil servants instead of jackbooted authoritarian thugs, which is generally the case when they come and they service our communities. But you know, look, this lady is a non threat. She's older. She can't physically take any of these guys down. And so they treated her as a non threat. But it's it's funny how selective they are about yep. non threats, right? Who they choose. To decide is somebody that doesn't need to be tackled or clotheslined or put in a chokehold. But yeah, it's interesting to watch this lady kick the hell out of these cops and they just take it. Yeah, and we've seen cops do takedowns of 10 year olds, 11 year olds, 12 year olds who happen yes, to be we black. Have. We've seen them engage in chokeholds. We've seen them engage in tackles of young children who are being aggressive at that moment. When the same thing applies that you just said, these kids were too light to do a damn thing to these cops. But that did not matter to the cop that was on the scene. All right, why is now always a pleasure, brother? How can people check you out, man, to follow you? Uh, please check out Wozniak. We've moved to a new time, so 5:30 uh, Pacific Standard Time every single Tuesday. Of course, you can read me and listen to me at the Ringer um, and the Ringer NBA show, and then of course listen to the Woke Bros. Me and Nando Vila, fellow TYT con- contributor, we do a podcast about politics um, and and have fun with it. So yeah, check those things out. Always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you. All right, be good. All right, we got more on the other side. Stick and stay, it's indisputable. You know what the progressive movement needs? It needs a little energy, a little pizzazz, maybe a little caffeine. Oh, coffee, but what if it was too strong coffee? Yes, new to strongcoffee.com slash TYT. Look, this helps progressive causes. It's also organic and fair trade. So you've got peace of mind that it was done right and it happens to taste great. So check it out right now at to strongcoffee.com slash TYT. The 300 million is a pretty good number, pretty good number. Well, that's the size of the US population. You know what our next target is? The size of the entire world. We just crossed five billion views on YouTube. I mean, imagine 10 years ago thinking one day. We <laughs> looked at you like, are you nuts? Young Turks has just passed uh, another milestone 15 billion views. Damn. All right, lots of comments. You guys are the best. I'm gonna read a few comments uh, from our members. Mr. M- Methuselah says on YouTube, Super Chat, uh, thanks for all the important work you do for TYT for the movement. Do you know who had the first Super Chat when I got back from vacation? You won't be sh- surprised to find out, Rob Shively. What do you know? Rob says rejoice for Dragon Daddy has returned. This question sent to us by Izzy Sanchez Jr. Is it me or is Meghan McCain talking as fast as Ben Shapiro? Is that the way the right tries to look smart and intellectual? Well, yes. Michael Nathan writes it on Twitter. Did Anna choose Jenk's outfit today? I'm sure it wasn't Jenk himself. Man bun Jenk in skinny jeans says, so now Anna has pointed out. <laughs> okay, that's his handle. T. Joyce 1971 saying Donald Trump is good at pulling out of things. NAFTA, the Iran deal, NATO. It's just too bad Fred Trump didn't. Quick plug here. It's not even a plug. I'm bragging, okay? I'm bragging. Watch me. We have a channel on YouTube, a whole channel devoted just to the Young Turks. It's badass, right? Wow, man. I can see the void. You guys are rock stars. Unbelievable. Senator Sanders, welcome to Rebel Headquarters. Man, you guys are amazing. We gave you what you wanted. Okay. Speaking of shirts. I have a surprise. You reached a lot of people, you are the Young Turks. And we have spread that progressive message wide and far. Let's keep it going. the head.
headline. We are willing to engage in transparent conversations with those who do not think like me. We also make sure that you know what's happening not only nationally, but in your local area. Make sure you tune in to Indisputable with Dr. Rashad Ritchie, Monday through Friday, 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 11.30 a.m. Pacific Time. Cool news, shopdyt.com now has books. Uh, there's a whole bunch of books there. Uh, you're gonna be shocked to find out that they're largely progressive. <laughs> of course, Ryan Grimm's book, we've got people is there. It's a fantastic story from Jesse Jackson to Bernie Sanders to AOC that explains the progressive movement probably better than any book I've ever read. Speaking of awesome books, my dad's got a book out called The Original Young Turk, where he goes from the poorest olive farmer you ever met in your life to living the American dream. All right, welcome back. Let me read some of these comments. Uh, TYT member Mickey C. The Silverhead Dragon says, The Albany incident happened in my backyard, and I'm not at all surprised. This solid red district has been horrible concerning uh, Black Lives Matter, with cops violently attacking peaceful protesters, then waiting days to quietly arrest them. Wow. Um, Cena Hogaboom says, Are you effing serious? Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice, John Crawford. Shot and killed or dragged off to jail for nothing, and they let her walk away. Yeah, they, as a matter of fact, he said, Listen, let's have a conversation away from here. All right, so it's more than just walking away, he's walking with her. O'Hara, uh, Kelly O'Hara says, If restaurant Karen keeps asking the food, she's going to be on the cover of Doing Time magazine. <laughs> That's a good one, Kelly. That's funny. 
Super chat, Tim Robinson says, lucky she wasn't black. Kicking a cop is a death sentence nowadays. Yep. Cassie Taylor says the bar owner is completely within her power to have the girl arrested. They should be fired. Twitch, um, Unicorn Glitty says BLM makes no sense to me since, since in America, black lives certainly do not matter because if they did, we wouldn't see this ish 10 times a day, right? Um, Jax Drax, police actually fear white people uh, is why they use kid gloves with them because they fear actual consequences. When they kill or assault a person of color is because of hatred, not fear. RC underscore tycoon 13 says cops should, uh, cops have shot POC, people of color, for a lot less. You're right. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. In the bullpen today, we have Jacob Rich, policy analyst, research, excuse me, Reason Foundation, uh, PhD candidate. Um, Case Western Reserve School of Medicine and Cleveland Clinic. Good day, sir. Welcome. Thank you for having me back, Dr. Richie. How are you doing? Hey, man, glad to have you back. Um, we're going to talk about mask and vaccine mandates. I don't want to presume what you believe or know about that particular topic. So if you would, brother, give us your sentiment as it relates to uh, mask and or vaccine mandates and protocol in America. Sure, so I wanna begin by commending you on a point that I think we agree on. I watched your previous episodes and saw that you were forwarding with the idea of treating previous COVID infection as synonymous with vaccination. And according to the data, previous infections actually more effective at preventing the future contraction of COVID-19 than the vaccine. So I'm glad that you've been reading the science. I don't expect anything less of you, so very good that we probably uh, agree on that point. But going from that point forward, I'm just I'm thinking about what the implications of vaccine mandates are currently, given the waning efficacy of the vaccine. So if you look at the data, if 100% of the population gets vaccinated, assume everyone delaying for political reasons or religious reasons or whatever, if 100% get vaccinated, we still do not reach herd immunity and we still have COVID-19 in front of us. So with such a low standard of efficacy after 100% vaccination, the idea that we cannot reach herd immunity afterwards, why are we allowing pharmaceutical companies to potentially bribe and lobby politicians to get their vaccines mandatory in the future? With such a low efficacy, given the Delta variant going around, I could see the flu vaccine being mandatory and that's not a future I want. So that's what's going through my head at the moment. Okay, all right, we'll deal with that and then we'll get into the mask mandates. I understand sure. your point of view as it relates to herd immunity because we exist in a global context. The idea on the science side that promotes herd immunity is that you are able to slow or eliminate the variant dynamic if you can get to a place of herd immunity and you can get through this and it's just a pandemic that you overcame rather than it becoming endemic um, as some would suggest. So let me push back a little bit on that. Um, I do believe that you can reach herd immunity through a maximum number of Americans vaccinated, not just because of the vaccinations, but when you look at some of the social scientists who have weighed in on this along with the medical data, it's also about America leading the world. It's about America being able to lead the conscious of other nations to develop similar protocols in order to get us to a place of actual herd immunity. And we've done this with other vaccinations before. And even when other countries would not implement things like polio mandates or tetanus mandates. When we did, we then influenced the rest of the global industrialized and developing nation context. Because after that, we said in order to travel here, in order to do business here, in order to have companies here, in order for us to do business there, these are some of the mandated protocols. And we've had these protocols on the books for many years. Um, so, so I understand your point of view, that's just the other point of view. The issue of mask mandates, it's really interesting to me. Uh, because to me, it's a very similar argument as the vaccine mandates for most. Now you make a different argument. And I actually think your argument has a little more intellectual integrity than the argument of it's a violation of civil liberty. That's not the argument you're making. Because if it's an argument of civil liberty, my complete pushback is that we have mandated vaccines uh, in America everywhere. We've always had mandated vaccines in the United States of America. I'm sure you're 
you have mandated vaccines in your body right now, correct? Of course. Yeah, all right, uh, and, and we never felt that it was a violation of civil liberty, or, or at least that was not the common narrative um, as it relates to those vaccine mandates. But let's talk about mask mandates. Do you really have a problem with a mask mandate? And, and, and after we chop that up, we'll go back to the vaccine protocol. Well, I'm just not exactly sure what the mask mandate is trying to accomplish. If we're at a position where we only reach herd immunity through infection, maybe we could have mask mandates in place until our young people, and I think this is mostly a school conversation. Maybe mm -hmm. we could have mask mandates in place until they're vaccinated and we reduce their rate of hospitalization. But that seems to be the only strategy forward. I think that this pandemic really only comes to an end after everyone gets infected because of the Delta variant and the waning efficacy of the vaccine. So are we just delaying until they're vaccinated? Is that, is that the idea? Masks certainly work. They remove the amount of moisture in the air and this, va this virus travels on that moisture. I know someone came onto your program and was discussing how small the virus is and how- <laughs> Right, but that's outside of, right. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's outside of the moisture context, right? Yeah, exactly. So I saw that. I understand that's ridiculous. Right. It's, um, while we implement the strategy forward, we do have to acknowledge that there are some negative consequences of masks, and mostly it's actually dental. And we don't have good data on this. I really was searching for the data before I came on the show so I could share it with you. But the only the most up to date data are 2019. But there are anecdotes of massive increases in various dental issues. And there is a condition called mask mouth that affects people who are in the employment. And if we're going to be risking the dental health of our young people in order to try to delay when they inevitably face the virus, I'm just not quite sure what the cost benefit analysis of this is. All right, so let's do the analysis, man. You're an analytical guy, right? So the first thing you weigh, obviously, are the variables that you can't control, that you understand. So we do understand that masks generally are safe. They are safe. Now, if you have to wear them every day, there will be some adverse effects to some people, not the majority. Now, here's the thing. We've always accepted in American society that for everything that can help us, to a certain population segment, it can harm them. Seat belts, like it or not, kill a certain number of people every year because they had on the seat belt. For some, they had it on improperly and they died because of the seat belt. Well, we don't ban seat belts. We still say, listen, the overwhelming data suggests and says, and is in fact true, that wearing a seat belt saves way more lives than it will ever extinguish. Right, And so we look at it from that context. Also, looking at the mask issue, well, the data is still coming in. We don't see um, severe side effects from the mask, at least not in what we would know as a statistical significance. But we do know that if you do not wear a mask, you get what's happening in Jackson County, Mississippi. Well, the superintendent has decided to eliminate all CDC protocols and his COVID positive rate for school aged children under his leadership is damn near 10%. It's almost 10% unheard of, way past the national average, way past the average of even adults. Uh, he has a 10% COVID positivity rate among students because he eliminated masks, all right? And a teacher has already died of COVID-19. So we know what it looks like when you eliminate masks. And let's talk about the mandate of masks. Masks are able to be mandated by the school boards, if we're talking about the school context. Over 60% of citizens in America, parents are for it. Um, they are the majority of parents are for it. The majority of uh, tax paying um, individuals in that, in that community are for the local school board having the ability to make a mask mandate requirement. Uh, and we know it does actually decrease the spread of COVID-19. But look at it statutorily. The school system has the legal authority by statute, which is derived actually from the 10th Amendment of the Constitution, to enact certain laws and prerequisites. For example, your regimen to be vaccinated comes from the school board, that's school board law. So you mean to tell me that the school board has the authority to mandate a needle being put in a child's arm, but they don't have the authority to tell a child to wear a mask? They have the authority to say these are the vaccinations required to enter this campus, but they don't have the authority 
uh, to to say wear a mask. And remember, they already enforce things like school uh, school dress codes, etc. This is commonplace, not a violation um, of any rule or constitutional right. Well, I wasn't. I never made the point to disagree with any of that. But there are a couple things that we need to keep in mind. First off, the example you gave is an anecdote. Quite possibly, the um, the resistance to wear mask in that school is why this is happening. But I would need a much larger data set before I make that sort of conclusion. Um, I can give anecdotes of places with no mask where there's not a problem, and that's why we always turn to the data. Uh, given the powers that school boards have and what local jurisdictions have over their students and parents and whatnot, I I mean, we could talk about that a little bit if you want, but that's that's really not my concern. My concern isn't really what the opinion is, it's about what's going to be effective. Yep. And back to your seatbelt example. The number of people who die from seatbelts a year compared to the amount of people who die in the road is statistically zero. That's why well, it's less. And let me let me just upon that one, one point. It is less than 1%. But I yeah. can make the same argument for masks. How many children have died of masks? Um, I assume it's probably less than seatbelts. Exactly. That's my point. Yeah. But I'm not I'm not talking about deaths from masks. I'm talking about dental cavities. Tooth decay, very like when you when stuff comes out of your mouth, that's your body getting rid of gross stuff. And if you are in school eight nine hours a day, maybe they're going to make the athletic kids wear a mask. It probably depends district to district. Do, but do we have any clinical data on that as of yet? We don't, but it's definitely a concern. And we 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 don't always Which have. Which is the heavier concern? The potential of something that has not been clinically proven. Or the clinically proven dynamic of a kid getting COVID and having respiratory issues forever, possibly hospitalized, and also infecting their family, their grandparents, their parents, etc. Which one is the heavier weight here? Well, I would say that we put the COVID lockdowns in place before we had many clinically proven conclusions, which we learned. Yeah, but we were right that the lockdowns were appropriate. There's just such potential danger, and we understand the science, and you understand what happens to various people who live in who have occupations where they cover their mouth, and how much higher of a chance they have of tooth decay. It's the tooth decay, the potential tooth decay of the entire child population to save how many child lives. Man, let me ask you, Jacob, are you are you really making the argument, brother, that some unproven claim, absolutely no scientific or clinical basis for the claim? Um, should be a reason that we hesitate or stop um, children from wearing masks in zones or school districts that have deemed it to be necessary based on the COVID positive rate in that local jurisdiction. There is definitely scientific evidence that this can happen. I just don't have the data because the CDC doesn't publish the data until next year. But this this is not me just opining on random things that can happen. This is me looking at various dental uh, records, various yeah. dental reporting. So you that. are making that argument that the dental issue is the issue uh, for you. It's not the only issue. It's one of many issues that can come from covering people's mouths. Okay. What comes uh, from not covering their mouth? What happens? COVID. <laughs> exactly. Which one is worse? It, it depends. It depends, it depends on each individual. I mean, okay. you have a 5% hospitalization rate among the entire population for COVID, right? And for children, it's much less. So it's how many children do we save by covering their mouths until we get them vaccinated versus the potential population effects of tooth decay and other things that could happen from You know, this. I gotta say, Jacob, listen, man, you're a smart guy, but, but I don't feel you on this argument because one, there is no clinical study to suggest this is a cause and effect reality for young people. Two, if you do find that there is something to this, maybe a year down the road, um, I would I would argue the numbers. I'm sure the numbers are going to show it impacts a very small minority of the data set um, because once again we're weighing the amazing impact. Um, of COVID-19 on our population, not just children. And remember this, brother, we talk about it from the context of children all the time because that's where a lot of the conversation is. That's where a lot of the news is following the mask mandates, etc. But the reality is none, none of these children exist in a silo. They all go home to somebody. They go home to parents, they go home to grandparents. Sometimes they go home to siblings that are that already have compromised immune systems, perhaps, right? So they, they live in a larger context is my, is my point. And when you look at the 
actual the actual weight of the potential of COVID infection. You have to say the very small weight of the unproven potential of tooth decay somewhere down the road is a small weight, brother, right? In comparison I, I to disagree. the massive weight of COVID. No, tooth tooth decay in oral health is one of the most important. It, it's not proven, brother. Listen, it's honey buns proven, uh, lead to tooth decay more so than what you're talking about. It's not proven because we don't have the data yet. So just honey buns are proven. Data doesn't mean it's not something that we need to consider. I mean, okay. we're, now we're talking in circles, right? Yeah. All right. Let we me let me have, move. We also don't have good data on the effect of the mask mandates. We have incredible data on how effective masks are. But if you put the mask mandates at the school level, what if the kids all hang out with each other after they go to school? You can't mandate the mask at school. So I can't even really create a cost benefit analysis of how many lives we're saving. Yeah. We're basically swimming through this with just an incredible lack of data. Which is one of the major points I want to make is we need better data. We need to start randomly testing the entire country for COVID and for antibodies and for infections all across the country. I don't know why we haven't done that. Greenland's done it and they have incredible data because of it. Um, so yeah, I mean, w without a whole bunch of data on either side, I feel like we're making these policies blind. And that's probably why so many people have died from COVID up to now. What else does Greenland do? Um, they probably mandate vaccines. <laughs> right, and uh, and they got a whole lot of people vaccinated, brother. They did. Uh, more than us, of course. Well, yeah. I mean, we have a much larger population. The logistics of them doing it's much easier as well. And, but the issue, I mean, you talk about logistics. Um, we have the vaccine more readily available to us in America. We can go to a CVS and get the vaccine than they do in Greenland. Some people have to travel miles, a lot of miles in order to get access to a place that will distribute the vaccine. So it's an issue of psychology and education for Greenland. And and they came together, they came together on this and they have utilized common sense protocols, mask wearing, social distancing, taking the vaccination when it was available. You got people already signed up for the booster shot in Greenland. So you're dealing with a completely different psychological dynamic than in the United States of America. But you just proved my point, brother. When you do implement these common sense protocols and you do engage in the in the sentiment of let's do this for each other, you have a better outcome. Greenland has not only done it, they've collected the data and it's readily available. You just cited it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think Greenland's been incredibly proactive this entire pandemic. Um, I've been. But if America was that proactive, would you be in agreement with what Greenland did being implemented in America? Well, probably the only thing that Greenland has done, and I have to look at specifically, I haven't specifically looked at their vaccine mandates. I yeah. assume, I mean, just because of how the Nordics tend to. Uh, operate things, I assume they have it. But I haven't really evaluated their specific policy in that aspect yet. So among everything they've done, the only thing that I probably oppose is the vaccine mandate. And the United States is actually kind of different from Greenland this way. The ability for pharmaceutical industries to lobby and to compel things in Greenland is much less because Greenland is kind of dependent on our technology. Yeah. The vaccines they're implementing in Greenland are from us, right? So. I mean, the vaccine mandate is something that's really, it's really centered on American policy and everyone else is really going to be following it. And the pharmaceutical companies, if you allow them to move forward with mandating vaccines that don't get us to herd immunity after 100% of the population has taken it, what else can they mandate? All right, so now, brother, you just made the first point I made to you. You made it back to me. You know what point that is? Um, inform me. That's right. And well, also, if well, you know the points. huh? No, I said inform me. Well, what's the point that no, you were trying to make? To when me? America leads in COVID vaccination, herd immunity happens in this country. It leads other nations to the same conclusion because America has done this routinely with other vaccines. Yes, but that's with diseases where if you take the vaccine. You, for all intents and purposes, have a 100% resistance to the vaccine. Take something like um, polio or small or measles. Measles is incredibly infect, infective. There's about it has an R naught of 15 to 20, which means the average person will infect 15 to 20 people. Hmm. With something that infectious, you need at least 95% of the population vaccinated to move forward. 
Right. And luckily, the measles vaccine is that effective. If you take it, you're not going to get measles. With COVID-19 and the COVID vaccines, that is not the case. And we should expect a, a higher standard before we make things mandatory. All right, let me ask you, I'm running out of time. And I, I would like to get into a rabbit hole with you on that. But I got to get you on the record with this. You Go all ahead. keep calling it a COVID, a COVID vaccine mandate. Yes. Biden literally signed an executive order that's not a COVID vaccine mandate. We disagree. It is, say that again. I said we disagree, but go ahead. All right, so let me talk. explain why it's not a mandate. Um, let's take the, it was three or four executive orders. Let's take the one that's primarily discussed because it impacts private companies, which means workforce employee, employees. Um, if you have one, over 100 employees, 100 employees or more, um, your company has to either A, make sure the workers get a COVID vaccine or yeah. B, not yes. get one, right? Or B, not get one, and they do have to test on a seven day per testing schedule, weekly schedule, in order to continue to be in compliance. Now, they are using OSHA in order to implement and oversee this rule. OSHA doesn't have the manpower, let's be real. OSHA does not have the manpower to actually enforce this policy. So, likely, what OSHA will do is OSHA will look at hot spots that come up based on reporting and they will then implement the protocol and enforce the protocol for that particular company. But OSHA is in existence by constitution and statute. So you call it a mandate, but there's no mandate for the vaccine. It literally says the opposite, you do not have to get the vaccine. And then OSHA as a regulatory agency created in the 1970s because of the Commerce Clause of the US Constitution. Which basically says Congress has the right to create a regulatory agency that can govern or create administrative law for anything dealing with interstate commerce. Well, yes, COVID impacts interstate commerce. That's your constitutional clause, your commerce clause. And they exist, OSHA exists to administer administrative law by way of the Congressional Act in the 1970s. And beyond that, this is an ETS. It is temporary, it is an emergency temporary standard that by law can only be in place for a certain number of days. And then OSHA would have to go through the traditional bureaucracy, which includes public input in order to make it permanent administrative law. So there is no mandate, there is no constitutional violation, and there is no statutory violation based on the current rules, laws, and constitution. Um, I disagree with almost all of that. Um, I wrote down your part so I can go down point by point though. So first of all, this, um, this, this rulemaking that the Biden administration just put forward is probably the closest thing to a vaccine mandate that I've ever seen. You so know, you admit it's not a mandate. Well, I'm gonna say, I mean, there's a spectrum of mandates. There's yeah, but you said it was a mandate. Now you're saying it's the closest thing to a mandate, which means it's not a mandate. Go For ahead. For all intents and purposes, it's a mandate. And I'm going not to explain mandate. why. It's the most mandate of laws that we've really mandate-y? seen. Mandate? Okay, brother, go ahead. Okay. All right. So if you look at schools and schools that man that have mandatory vaccines, which is all states, all states technically have public schools that mandate vaccines. Correct. But all but six allow religious exemptions. If you're if you're a parent and you don't want to vaccinate your kids, there's a really good chance you won't have to. So there's there's plenty of exemptions. And what Biden's doing, what President Biden is doing, I try to be respectful, he is basically threatening your livelihood for about 80 million Americans to get vaccinated. Or take the test. This, what? Or take the test. Yeah, well, but he's basically compelling them because the tests are incredibly expensive. No, sir. Tests, no, sir. Yes, they are. If, no, let, if you have lots of employees, it's very expensive to carry out. Let, these let tests. me let me opine on that because that that is a point you bring up, and I think it's a good point subsidizing to make. Subsidizing these tests for the companies. Say that again. Is the government subsidizing the tests for the companies? And they should. They, they should. should. Yeah, now, no, many of the tests will be different, but they're not. Right. Many of the tests are actually available, especially in. Um, cities that places like Atlanta, you can get a test for free. 
All right, you can get a test a bunch of times, no charge. But there are spots in America where people are charging for tests, okay? If you don't have insurance, you may be you know, SOL, all right? You have to pay for it. I do not believe the individual employee nor the employer um, should have to foot that cost. I do think there should be a federal subsidy to reimburse companies for the cost of employees who would prefer to take the test. Go ahead. And once that's put into place, then I would say that this really isn't that big of a deal. Okay. It's just that without that type of subsidy, the Biden administration is telling companies that they need to pay for these tests. And that has actually led a bunch of companies to mandate the vaccine or face being fired or to mandate the vaccine by threatening the amount of money they make with their health insurance. Yeah. So, I mean, you're basically in the situation where the government is able to very effectively risk your livelihood. Well, you know, that's by design. So we know this, brother. That is not a coincidence. They've gone on record. I'm glad that Democrats are actually saying this is to make it difficult to not be vaccinated. They have said that on the record. Biden said it in so many words. Dr. Fauci basically said it exactly like I just said it. Um, so I'm glad glad they're at least telling the truth about it. All right, we, we got like one minute or two, brother. Go ahead and make your next point. Well, uh, the constitutionality of okay. this, well, it, it's actually arbitrary. So you're right, the OSHA does have broad ability to make laws, but so did the CDC and the CDC's moratorium was struck down as unconstitutional. And it was struck down as unconstitutional because they kept leveraging it over and over again. But now that the Supreme Court has had a chance to rule on it, they're never allowed to do it again. Yeah, yeah, they overused it, brother. They, it was struck down really because of overuse. Uh, there should have been a statutory dynamic that they allowed the CDC. CDC did the right thing, in my opinion. Uh, it would have created a public health issue uh, if you do evictions in the middle um, of a pandemic. I agree 100% with the logic, uh, but I do think it should have been taken up statutorily after that, and which we could not get uh, agreement across the board for how to do this long term. My sure. producers are telling me I got to wrap it up, man. Always fun having you on the show. Well, thanks for having me again. Thanks, Dr. Absolutely, Richie. man. All right, ladies and gentlemen, remember, take care of yourself, take care of each other, and take care of the planet. Remember, the truth is always indisputable.